If you're someone who has just purchased a brand new vehicle, be it powered by tiny controlled explosions or maybe an electrochemical reaction, the chances are you'll take that vehicle back to the place you purchased it for regular maintenance for the first few years of its life, as well as having any repair work done under warranty. If you're really lucky, you might even have a preferential rate on those first few services, or indeed have those services carried out free of charge for the first few years of ownership. You'll also take your vehicle back to that same place for official recall work to be carried out because, well, your vehicle will have come with a comprehensive standard manufacture warranty covering pretty much everything for the first few years and then longer separate warranties covering things like the powertrain. If your vehicle isn't brand new or you've travelled so far in it that you've driven past the limit of the standard warranty, then you'll need to get anything that isn't an official recall fixed out of pocket. That means you're going to have to pay for it. And that, from official dealerships, can be pretty darned expensive. The alternative for most internal combustion engine vehicle owners is to head to a local garage in their neighbourhood and to get the work done for far less than the official dealership would charge. In the electric vehicle world, though... Well, save for a few specialists, finding non-dealer service can be a real pain in the butt, and getting your EV worked on can prove pretty expensive. Effectively, EV repairs are being gatekept, and that could have long-term impacts on the ability of older EVs to stay on the road. Let's look into why that is, who's to blame, and what needs to change to fix this particularly pernicious problem. Statistically speaking, at least according to the analytics we have access to, if you are watching this channel right now, you're most likely someone who classifies as a boomer or a Gen X. You're likely someone who grew up at a time when owning a car in your final year or years of high school was seen as something of a rite of passage. Someone whose first car was probably purchased for a ridiculously small amount of money and someone who likely spent your entire spare time wrenching on it or perhaps had a job after school in order to raise the money to pay to keep it on the road. You may or may not know how to adjust your valves using a feeler gauge. You may know how to remove an oil filter and perhaps you've done more complex repairs like removing the engine and replacing the clutch or maybe even carried out some shonky 1980s, early noughties bodywork repairs. While I'm a Gen X, I actually grew up in a carless household in the 1980s and because we never had a car past my third or fourth birthday, I didn't learn to drive until I was just about to graduate from university. So I missed out on a lot of the usual car ownership stuff of teenage years. That said, I did end up with my first car, a classic car from the 1960s when I was 23. So I played catch up pretty quickly. If you are younger than I am, you may have not enjoyed the same cutting of teeth on easy-to-fix cars as I did. My children's generation, they are 20 and 21 respectively, have pretty much missed out on all of the old-school car ownership experiences. And they are from the generation where, if it's broken, you take it to a garage. And that's mostly because more modern vehicles often need specialist tools or computers even to do the most benign of simple tasks, whereas cars from my formative years could mostly be fixed with a screwdriver, a wrench, and of course, a suitably sized hammer. As I said in the introduction, if the vehicle you're buying is powered by an internal combustion engine, the chances are you're going to be able to find a local garage willing to help you keep it on the road. But in the EV world, there's seemingly some pretty significant gatekeeping going on over parts and repair procedures. So today, 
I'm going to put on my metaphorical deer stalker, grab my magnifying glass and figure out exactly who's to blame. But I can already tell you that it's a mixture of automaker and dealer protectionism, lack of knowledge around EVs and the industry as a whole, old-fashioned FUD and basic economics. Let's try and look at them in order. Automakers and dealerships are the first likely culprits. While it's accurate to say that electric vehicles are far less mechanically complex than internal combustion engine ones, and the list of things that need to be carried out on a regular basis as part of a regular maintenance schedule is far smaller for an EV than for an ICE vehicle, it's also fair to point out that ICE vehicles have formed pretty much the basis of the auto industry for so long that automakers and dealerships are still very much hard-coded for suck, squeeze, bang, blow. The number of cars that share a particular engine or fuel system is far higher than the number of electric cars that share a particular battery pack or motor setup. This means parts are easier to come by and repair procedures are far better known because your average mechanic at a dealership is going to see an order of magnitude more ICE vehicles through their shop than they will see EVs, they're going to have a much more comprehensive knowledge of possible issues, pitfalls and correct repair procedures. What isn't particularly well known is that in order for an official dealership to be allowed to work on a new car, at least one mechanic at the dealership must go through official training before the vehicle goes on sale. Without at least one mechanic being approved to work on the vehicle, the dealership may not even be able to sell said model. By the way, this is true of all vehicles and explains why, for example, some Lexus garages won't work on the oh-so-expensive, limited-production, hand-built LFA. Or indeed why some Nissan garages won't work on the Nissan Z family of sports cars. Tied in with the requirement to be an officially approved automaker dealership to carry out official warranty repair work is the requirement that repair shops follow standard manufacturer approved repair procedures. And given that automakers would prefer repair shops don't dig around inside your battery pack, those official repair procedures may not always be the most affordable repair route for customers. Worse still, shops not following standard repair procedures could risk losing their official service moniker, which can affect not only the relationship with the relevant automaker, but also said auto shop's ability to obtain parts at preferential rates and much more. The are a few exceptions here. Some automakers are actually okay with properly certified repair technicians opening up the battery pack and replacing modules because their cars have been designed with that in mind. Uh, but other car companies? Oh no, 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 no. Something goes wrong in the pack, the whole pack has to be replaced. And that's that can be costly. There's also a massive issue surrounding repair caused by the sheer rate of innovation in the EV world. We're seeing new cars come to market which ultimately go through multiple battery pack configurations before the 5 to 10 year lifespan of a traditional car model is up. This not only makes it hard to keep repair parts in stock at sensible prices, but it also makes the job of being a trained repair specialist on said vehicles much, much harder. The final part of the dealership and automaker problem comes in the form of old versus new vehicles. It goes without saying that automakers would much rather you buy a brand new car with new bells and whistles than keep that 15-year-old EV on the road especially if they can slap in some new monthly fees for things that used to be free. No, I'm, I'm not bitter. I'm middle-aged. Get off my lawn. At the same time, automakers want their dealerships to work on their new hotnesses, so incentives to keep staff trained on older models are smaller than incentives to train that said staff on new models. Add in the fact that there's an inevitable churn at the dealerships as technicians move, change careers or 
become international spies, and when a dealership loses one of the last people who's certified to work on an older car, several things can happen. First, if there is at least one person left who is certified to work on your particular older EV, the dealership can charge more for that person's time, increasing the cost to you. And second, when that person ultimately leaves, the dealership may opt to not train someone new, especially if they know they have a limited number of vehicles in their customer fleet that will require that specific training. This, by the way, recently happened here on the US West Coast. We noticed that our local Chevrolet garage had dozens of Chevrolet Bolt EVs in the parking lot, and we wondered if they were all trade-ins that were going to be made available as used vehicles soon. Upon digging further, we were told that no, they were all in for service, as our local Chevrolet dealership was one of the few in the area with enough trained technicians willing and able to work on the Chevrolet Bolt EV and do things like battery swaps. Before I get to the next part of my discussion on EV repair gatekeeping, let's talk about this particular t-shirt I'm wearing and how you can get one yourself. I honestly think that this is Erin's best t-shirt design to date, and there's still plenty of time to order yours in time for Halloween. Many of you already have, so if you haven't, how about it? You'll support the channel too, and the link is in the description. The next gatekeeping in the industry when it comes to repairs is, of course, the general lack of knowledge as a whole, and I'm going to tie this together with FUD. That's fear, uncertainty, and doubt. The automotive repair industry today is far more repaired for electric cars than it was just a decade ago. And things are improving on an everyday basis. But there's still a significant number of people working in the industry who are either untrained or do not want to train on electric vehicles. They may be my age or perhaps even older with 20 plus years of working in the industry. They look at EV sales volumes today and in many parts of the world, view it as it is, a tiny proportion of the overall new car sales. Unless they're working at a dealership where training is provided for them to actually work on EVs, they may view electric vehicles as a fad, a distraction, or in fact worse. After all, why train on something that's going to bring you in a tiny amount of custom for now when people are lining up around the block to have their alternators repaired, their head gaskets replaced, and their emissions computer systems fixed. It makes no sense. Worse than that, while internal combustion engine principles may have remained pretty much the same for a century or more, the ways that automakers put cars together has definitely become more complicated. Gone are the days when replacing a fuse literally meant lifting the hood and reaching to an easily accessible fuse box where you removed the cylinder fuse that you needed to replace, probably on the firewall. And today we are at a position where, for some vehicles at least, replacing the fuse can be a full multi-hour repair procedure because the offending fuse is hidden underneath things like trim pieces, air intakes and more. Oh, and let's not forget that the average age of the global vehicle fleet has become older as people have found their wallets increasingly tightened. Sure, those who can afford to buy new do, often switching to an EV, but many, many more people, including some of you watching, are doing everything possible to keep your existing paid off cars on the road, even if that means spending more than you might like on repairs. If, as a mechanic, you're getting a decent income from your existing customer base, why spend more to train on vehicles that you won't likely often see and already can't actually fit into your schedule? This is particularly true for independent shops in areas of the world where there's a lot of FUD in the media about EVs. 
Of course, it would be wrong for me to point fingers. And I promise I'm not pointing fingers. But but places where certain political viewpoints are more popular also, curiously, tend to be places where finding independent specialists to work on your older EV is particularly hard. I know correlation is not causation, but... It's funny how those same places are often where you can find someone willing to illegally modify your diesel truck's emissions control system. Isn't that weird? The FUD surrounding EVs means that many mechanics won't work on them, aren't interested in learning how to work on them because of... insert some random fear here. Sometimes it's fear of electrocution, sometimes it's fear of a fire, sometimes it's... Look, I don't know what the fear is, but I swear to your favourite deity that there is a subset of people out there who think that working on electric vehicles will make them the gay. Apparently they think that's a bad thing. Finally, let's look at economics. Because the majority of EVs on sale in the last decade or so rely on parts that either never were or are no longer being made in large enough quantities, parts prices are kept artificially high. You can, in some cases, replace older components with their newer counterparts, but often you have to replace like for like, and that leads to a terrible situation where parts are being made in small batches, where their prices are kept artificially high, and patent parts aren't really a thing. This is, by the way, in contrast to internal combustion engine vehicles, whose parts are often shared between multiple different models, and where pattern parts, parts made by copying original components, are really common. You can go online today and buy any number of pattern spark plugs for any common engine made in the last 50 years, but you might struggle to find the exact match for the relay contactor that ensures your 4 or 800 volt battery pack isn't live when the car isn't on or charging. A lack of good, affordable parts, which by the way is also caused by automakers not really wanting people to make third party parts, combined with manufactured parts scarcity, means that you're paying through the nose for new parts for your older EV. And sometimes, if you're really strapped for cash, finding a repair specialist willing to either dig down and replace that one broken component within a larger assembly, or in fact swapping it out for a known good one from another vehicle of a similar age, is the only affordable option. That is, unless you're willing to pay an official repair specialist a huge chunk of your children's future to keep your EV on the road. But look, I'm getting ahead of myself here, because the whole matter of affordable EV repairs and why the conceit of trickle-down economics for EV ownership doesn't work is for another video. And on that note, we're done today. If you have comments, drop us a polite note in the Discord chat room below on Mastodon, or if you are a Patreon supporter, in the comments there. If you want more, subscribe, hit the bell, and follow the links to regularly support us with a YouTube membership or a Patreon subscription. You'll also find links to our Ko-fi, Bitcoin, and swag store right below. There's no Mac Easter egg on this video because I'm going to need to take a little longer on the next bit. Scrolling on my right is a list of amazing Charged Up supporters. And if you are not on the list yet, thank you to those of you who've reached out and told us you weren't. We're sorry. We are working on a replacement because of the automated process we've previously been using has had some issues. And we are rejigging our credit setup. Erin's got some great ideas, so watch this space. And if you have recently joined and your name isn't on the list, I'm sorry. We haven't generated a new list while we've been sorting out those particular bugs. In the meantime, thank you to all the people listed and all of the people who have recently joined our Patreon. Our YouTube ad revenue is still about $3,000 less than it normally is, so you are really helping us stay afloat and avoiding bad things for the channel. Thank you. And if you are someone who has just $1 a month to spare, please consider supporting us as we are still quite considerably lower on our YouTube ad revenue than we would like. 
every month this YouTube ad apocalypse continues. Shout outs go out to our VTG Patreon supporters Alan Tupper, Andrew Martin, Bennett Elder, Brophy Wolf, Chris Maxwell, Cyprian Laplace, Dan Blair, Gordon C, Hey Esker, John Tremal, Carl Fox, Mark Eggleton, Peter Dillinger, Regine Fellows, Sean Tucker, Stefan Fremgen, Stephen Williams, Taslet in the Gong, Paul Bricknell, Tony Moss, Carl Hodgson, Chris Asentar, Denny Hyde, Lance Schlal, Linda Irish, Mike Weeder, and Paul Nelson. And finally, big thanks to our off grid supporters Paul Colmay, Kevin Burrowbridge, Stephen O'Donoghue, Jim Vanessa, Robert Flannery, Aaron Hahn, Ellery Hensley, Rory Litwin, JP Fagerback, Dave Kitchen, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, Chris and Michael Johnson, Clay Witch, CPU Freak 101, Eric Knack, Joe Bresney, John Henderson, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Nigel S, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, and of course, Ian. Don't forget that we make videos every Monday, Wednesday, Friday and Saturday on this channel. Plus on a Sunday, you'll see us over on Transport of L Take 2. And with that, I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. I'll see you soon. And as always, keep evolving. Keep evolving.